Members of the American Postal Workers Union handle more than 165 billion letters and packages a year. That's about 34 million pounds of mail every day. Ever wonder what this costs you as a taxpayer? Millions? Tens of millions? Hundreds of millions? Not a single cent. The United States Postal Service doesn't run on your tax dollars. It's funded solely by stamps and postage. Brought to you by the men and women of the American Postal Workers Union. You turn on the television or you pick up a newspaper magazine and all the information you see is just controlled by a, a handful of corporations. So how are you or I or any of us? How can we get our messages out to people? How can you tell people what you care about? You can go on Facebook and compete with uh, hundreds of people who post things that may or may or may not be true. You can go on Twitter and post things in a, with a handful of characters because Twitter is really the place for literate people to hang out. Or you could go in with a sandwich board and walk the streets. You could write a letter to the editor. Or, even better, you could go to public access television. Public access serves your community on a first come, first serve basis. And whether you're rich or poor, doesn't matter. It's first come, first served. Everyone in the community is welcome to come to public access and talk about not only the issues that are important to them, but if you have a, a poem to recite, a story to tell, a song to sing, just anything at all that's in your mind or heart to tell, you come to public access. Public access in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where I'm speaking right now, has been around since 1980, and I've seen it change events in Fayetteville. And uh, the nice thing about public access now in the 21st century is that it's not just on a television channel, but it's also on the internet, so you can reach people around the world. So if you're just, if you feel frustrated at not being able to talk to people, not being able to get your message out, and you think there's no way to do it, well, take heart, there is. Public access, it's a vital component of our First Amendment rights. So public access, like the man says, use it or lose it. Hello, I'm Adela Gray, and you are watching Fayetteville Public Access TV. Hi, Wednesday is Jacob George. Jacob, how are you? Good, Richard. Jacob, you made some headlines lately. Uh, you were with dozens of veterans when you uh, returned medals, or I guess threw them over the fence in Chicago mm -hmm. in protest of the war. That's correct. Um, now, what was, what was the event? What, what, was, what was going on in Chicago at the time? Well, basically, there was a NATO summit yeah. uh, that was happening in Chicago, and uh, we had tried to contact... Uh, generals within yeah. NATO who would ceremoniously receive our medals uh, at the summit. Uh, and they did not respond. Uh, they did not want to participate. So we decided to throw them as closely as we could to where the summit was happening. So why did you want to return your medals? Well, there's many different reasons. Uh, everyone who returned their medals, every veteran uh, stood up and said something different. Uh, but overall, we wanted to challenge the narrative of war, uh, and we are also seeking our own personal healing from the wounds of war. Yeah. Um, so, I guess, and the accounts I've read, there are several dozen, several dozen of you. Who yes, did this. I think there was uh, 44 altogether, uh, and every everyone who participated through at least two or more. So yeah. there was uh, well over 100 medals that were returned. So, and because you couldn't meet with the generals, uh, you end up having to throw them over the fence. 
Yes, that's correct. Well, we threw him as close to the fence as we could. Okay. <laughs> the, the police presence also would not let us approach the fence, so we just had to lob him from the stage. Ah, uh, okay. Now you're on a stage. It was a tractor trailer okay. uh, stage that was out there. Um, so we stood on that in front of the crowd that followed us to that site. Okay. Now you're a veteran. Yes. And uh, you've served, what, several tours of duty yes. in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. um, now, could you tell us what, what medals that you had that you threw that you, that you returned? I returned my Global War on Terrorism Medal yeah. and the Expeditionary Medal uh, that is awarded for very similar reasons. Uh, and almost everyone that participated uh, returned those. Uh, some returned all. Uh, some returned good conduct medals. Yeah. Uh, some returned all kinds of stuff. So. So, what was it like? I mean, because th this medal is a part of you I mm -hmm. mean, as a soldier. Um, no matter no matter how you feel about the war, this medal is still a part of you. And uh, what was it like for you to to separate part of yourself and to sort of um, and, and to actually to ask, actually physically throw it is is like physically throwing. A spiritually a part of yourself mm -hmm. uh, back at them. What was it like for you? It was a very powerful experience. Uh, the second uh, someone had mentioned to me, hey, we're considering returning medals at the NATO summit, I felt conflicted immediately. Yeah. Uh, and I felt conflicted up until the point to where I did it. And even afterwards, right now, I'm still kind of on the fence about it. Yeah. But uh, overall, it was a tremendous healing experience. The second it left my hand, like you said, it felt like I had released something. Yeah. Uh, and I was watching my veteran sisters and brothers go through the same thing, and, and every time they did it, it looked the same. Yeah. Uh, and it was very powerful for us to do that together and to do it with each other. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you know, the second it left my hand, I knew I had done something that I needed to do. Yeah. Uh, and I wouldn't have a lot of opportunities to do that in my life. So right. it felt good and it felt right. Right. How did you come to join the military in the first place? Well, I grew up, you know, here in Arkansas yeah. in the Washita Mountains. Uh, my dad's a chicken farmer. Uh, he works down in the River Valley. Yeah. So I spent many days on his farm. Uh, and uh, joining the military was uh, a rite of passage in the manhood. It yeah. was a way to climb the socioeconomic ladder. Definitely. It was a way to go to school. Yeah. I couldn't afford that, and neither could the family. Uh, so, you know, it, there was a lot of good reasons for yeah. me to join. So how did you, how, how, what, what, how did you end up in Afghanistan? Well, uh, yeah, after 9-11 happened, um, our unit uh, was going to deploy to Afghanistan. Uh, yeah. That was about a month after 9-11. Right. I was 19. Uh, so that was my first tour. Uh, and then I returned in the summer of 2002, and then my third was 03 into 04. Yeah. Now, when we talk about tours of duty, how long are we talking about a, a period of time we talk about tour of duty? Well, some people will serve over a year. Yeah. Uh, it all depends on what unit you're uh, with or attached to and what you're doing while you're there. Right. Uh, so I never did in over eight months while okay. I was there. They were relatively short compared to what regular army units were doing while they were there. Yeah, so what, what kind of thing were you doing in Afghanistan? Uh, for the most part, we were working with uh, Afghans, uh, mostly Uzbek and Tajik, uh, and teaching them Western standards for uh, building things um, and also uh, blowing things up. That's a time-honored human tradition, blowing things up? It is in the military, yeah. that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> no matter what military. Yeah. So, um, so how did you how did, how did you like that work? Well, <clears throat> I actually really enjoyed working with the Afghans. Yeah. Uh, you know, Afghanistan is a very mountainous country. Yeah. Uh, very craggy granite, sharp. Yeah. It's pretty young. Yeah. And uh, it felt. It felt nice working with hillbillies in yeah. Afghanistan because yeah. that's uh, what I closely identify with. Yeah. So, you know, I was among hillbilly farmers and right. I'm a hillbilly farmer. So uh, that was a lot of fun and I felt it was just and I was doing something good. I was, you know, developing relationships with people and right. doing what I could. I didn't have uh, much malice in my heart. Right. Um, so at some point 
in Afghanistan, <clears throat> you began um, to feel radicalized, I guess, and that's the only word to describe it, um, because um, you joined us, I guess, a sense of patriotism, not only not only just for to get ahead financially, but um, there was something in Afghanistan. There was there was obviously something that changed your mind or, or, or made you see things in a different way? Mm -hmm. Well, there was a series of things that did that. Uh, but a, a most notable experience is uh, the summer of 2002. I had just gotten off the Pakistan border. Yeah. Uh, and my squad leader had a memo that he was handing around to all of us. Uh, and I was watching everyone's face as they were reading it, and it was changing. I was the lowest ranking person, so the last person to, to yeah. get my hands on it. When I read it, it called for the mobilization of 500,000 soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines for impending invasion of Iraq the next spring. And that was uh, heartbreaking uh, to a lot of us uh, because, again, this was the summer of 2002. We hadn't right. yet heard the drums of war. Yeah. Uh, for Iraq. We were still in Afghanistan. Right. Uh, so we went home in September uh, and then we watched our citizenry slowly get talked in yeah. to going <clears throat> to war and to a war that had already been decided. Right. And there was, that's when I, when I really started to uh, lose my faith in our democratic process. Uh, because preferably, if we are a democracy, then we're asked if we want to spend our money and our blood on war. Uh, but clearly, in this case, we weren't asked. Uh, the decision was made, and then we were made to go along with it. Yeah, <clears throat> it was like it, there was there was no really the clear, there was clearly no debate on it. And mm -hmm. if you if you even questioned, it was like you're somehow un-American. Totally, totally, and you know. Uh, uh, it was reported that the, <coughs> the largest assembly, assembly in, in, in uh, modern history uh, for standing up against war happened at the, the coming of the Iraq War. Right. Millions around yeah. this planet stood up and said, this is wrong. Right. Uh, and again, we saw that this wasn't a democratic process. Right. We saw that this was going to happen regardless yeah. of what the people of this planet think. Yeah, because, I mean, it was, it was decided. It was almost like it was decided uh, before we went into Afghanistan. Mm, that, that could be. Yeah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> it, it, it seems a lot of people seem to feel like uh, they, seem to, they seem to see the military as this one big block. They're all, they're all big supporters of the war effort. They can't imagine people in the military um, having any opposition to the war. Well, I think that's unfortunate uh, that people would see it like that because there are a lot of people in the military who oppose it, but there's a, there's a moral and ethical and a financial dilemma. Yeah. Um, a lot of people join, like myself, in what is called uh, uh, the economic draft right now. Right, yeah. Uh, and uh, if they are to dissent, if they are to speak uh, and challenge the narrative of war, they're going to lose their livelihood. They're going to lose the ability to provide for their family. They're going to lose the health care that they very much need um, for challenging the narrative. So, you know, there are a lot of people. Would you, would you get a discharge? Uh, you can get a discharge, uh, and they can make it as painful as possible. Like a like a less than honorable discharge. Uh, well, you could file for conscience objector status, um, but the process of hazing uh, uh, that happens when you do something like that, and the just the process you have to go through all together, uh, is very demeaning. It's very painful. Uh, you know, you're guaranteed to be called names. I have a, a quite a few friends who have gone through that. Yeah. Through that, um, some have lost their mind and wound up in jail. Uh, some are still struggling a year later for the status. So, you know, there's a lot of complicated reasons for why uh, people do not speak out right now. Right. And people are still people are still uh, afraid to speak out. Really. Totally. I mean, it, it, it's hard. It, it, it's heartbreaking uh, that that people are still afraid. Um, we talk about Afghanistan, <clears throat> and there was a quote I read um, online. It was um, 
one former uh, soldier said, for every house that was entered, if there wasn't a terrorist inside, um, there was certainly one when you left. Hmm. Uh, there's a lot of truth to that. Uh, and, you know, same thing for the, every farm that we land on, yeah. every, every crop that we crush. You know, we're, we're definitely radicalizing people over there. Uh, one of the, my experiences over there that was very formative for me was just that. Uh, we landed on a farmer's field, uh, ran off the helicopter, we were very heavily armed, uh, and the look on his face to me said terror. Uh, and I really had to, you know, question who's the terrorist and what is terrorism. Now, people don't see that. People, people see movies. People see movies of the helicopter landing, troops coming in. They don't see anything else. Well, what's that like? What's that like when you come in? What's that like for the soldiers and for the farmer? Uh, well, as a soldier, you know, I have to be perfectly honest, I was just as scared as that guy. Yeah. Uh, but I w had uh, way more armor and right. uh, weaponry. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> and people surrounded me with the same thing. And, mm -hmm. and uh, so it's scary for everyone involved. It's yeah. definitely not a pleasant thing. Right. Uh, and I have to say, you know, if someone landed a, a helicopter on my dad's chicken house and heavily armed men ran out, right it's pretty likely that we would pick up weapons and, and fight back. Right. And uh, some of the reasons for this is uh, uh, there was a study done, I can't remember which province it was in Afghanistan, but, but uh, over 90% of the men in that province uh, did not know uh, what 9-11 was and that 9-11 happened. Uh, so they effectively really didn't understand why we were in Afghanistan. So try to imagine being a farmer not knowing why we're there, yeah. not even knowing that we really are there yet in the early days, and yeah. then all of a sudden a huge helicopter is landing in your field and people are running everywhere and, and right. shooting guns. So, so I mean, so so after we're after after you've left, what kind of shape is the guy's farming? Uh, well, that's an interesting question. A lot of <clears> times uh, they're destroyed and then they're protected. Uh, there's a lot of poppy in Afghanistan. Yeah, uh, Af Afghanistan. Uh, some people refer to it as a narco state. A large, right, yeah. uh, a large chunk of its economy comes from that crop. Uh, so, if it is in the best interests of whoever is operating in the area within NATO yeah. to protect the fields, uh, then negotiations with warlords will take place in order to make payments to rent an area for a base, uh, and the fields around that area will be protected. Uh, the U.S. Uh, at one point in this war had, has spoke highly of an eradication campaign in Afghanistan, yeah. and, and which is a complete farce. Uh, it's really? Not, well, it's not a good idea for one. Yeah. Uh, what worse idea would there be than to go around the country destroying the number one crop? Because then you basically have a bunch of unemployed farmers uh, who have nothing to do and who are really upset. Destroying their only source of income. Exactly. Yeah. So that isn't a good idea strategically. Uh, and it was never really on the table. It was just thrown out there as kind of a fancy one-liner for, for this global war on right. drugs. Uh, but the reality is poppy is uh, highly valuable as political capital and everything else in Afghanistan. What well, if you're a chicken farmer? And what was like your said? dad? What was like your dad? What if a helicopter land on your? If your, well, if your dad was in Afghanistan and some army helicopter land on his property, uh, would, would his farm be protected? Uh, totally not. You know there, uh, there are occasions where people are reimbursed yeah. for damages done the property or paid per children that is killed, uh, but that does very little. That doesn't do a whole lot. And yeah. even even in those cases, people aren't paid enough and they aren't paid as often as they should be. Isn't it, isn't it, I always thought that was sort of gruesome when people are paid uh, for family members who are killed. Right. I mean, it's like, how much, who decides what somebody's worth? I mean, I just, I, it's sort of like somebody sitting in an office somewhere deciding who's, how, how, who, who's worth what. It's luckily I never had to sit down to the yeah. negotiating table with a warlord to, between yeah. families. Uh, because I would have given him billions. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's just um, that's just amazing. Um, now, when you when you were in Chicago, um, you were actually there were other groups in Chicago too, and we, this did not get a lot of. And I hate to use the words like mainstream media because you you sound like some kind of lunatic, uh, conspiracy nut. But uh, in, in what do you see in the national news? Uh, there was like a group called uh, Afghans for Peace. Mm. 
And uh, can you tell us about Afghans for Peace? Uh, Afghans for Peace is, a, is an awesome organization. Um, they had teamed up with us so that we could plan this event in tandem. Yeah. And by us, I mean Iraq Veterans Against the War. Uh, and there's a handful of Afghan vets within that organization. Um, so we had gotten together with Afghans for Peace and basically said, uh, we're at your service, how do you want to do this? Yeah. Uh, and let's pull this off. And uh, uh, it was three women from Afghans for Peace. Uh, they had really great ideas. Uh, and we pulled it together, and something really awesome happened for really? all of us. Do you remember um, when in the early days, in the olden days, we would talk a lot about how one of the reasons for the war was to help the women in Afghanistan? I do. I actually I remember Laura Bush campaigning on it. Yes. Um, and... Uh, one of the most healing things about the ceremony was having three Afghan women standing on stage with us, uh, holding an Afghan flag and cheering us on as we returned our medals for yeah. the global war on terror. Uh, you know, it was quite the challenge to the common narrative uh, that we've had in this country. You don't, you don't think Afghani women are, are just grateful that we're there? <laughs> well, I, I know that. I mean, I know, I, I, that's, that's kind of, I know that sounds kind of snarky the way I ask that, but I mean, I mean, so why would not, why would Afghani women not be grateful that we're there? Well, I will, I'll have to look at U.S. forces yeah. uh, and then dig into that. Uh, so there's a mental health crisis in the U.S. military yeah. right now uh, and many other crises as well. Um, one in three women who are deployed uh, in Afghanistan are sexually assaulted by a fellow service member. One in three. As, and that's, and that is, it's, it's like, and we, we hear this on the news, we read it in magazines, it's like, and nobody seems to be taking that seriously. Not at all. I, to, to give you an example, when it gets dark outside, <clears throat> yeah. while I was over there, if I was on a base with a lot of women or, or working with uh, women in an area, they would request escorts to the porta potty just so they could go use the restroom you know, once American, it was dark uh, outside. Uh, a woman who's an American soldier should not have to request an escort. No, that not at just... all. So the narrative that we're there to liberate the women and give women's rights is um, it's, it's laughable uh, given the behavior uh, towards women in the liberating force. Now, I went back last year to work with Afghan youth and the, the yeah. non-anti-violent, you know, the anti -violent, uh, non-occupation movement, and they, uh, for the most part, the women in that um, were happy that the Taliban was gone, but they really want us gone as well. Right. Uh, so so that, that makes you, uh, gives you four tours of duty in Afghanistan, really. It, it does. Um, so they want, that to, that they want the Taliban gone, but they want us gone as well. Yes. So... What do, what do the women in Afghanistan see for the future? I mean, the, ones, the ones you know about, the ones you've talked to. Well, there was one, one in particular that said something very powerful to yeah. me. Uh, she helped found the Afghan Women's Skills Development Council, yeah. which actually formed while the Taliban was still in control in Afghanistan. So it's a pretty hardcore group of women right. uh, to still be doing that work to this day. And, um, you know, I asked her, what will really make life better for women in right. Afghanistan? Because I, that's one of the main reasons I came over right. uh, and believed in what I was doing. And uh, she got kind of a smile on her face and she said, uh, Mr. George, do women oppress women in your country? And uh, I said, for the most part, no, I don't really observe that. Uh, and she said, it's the same thing in Afghanistan. She said, the women do not oppress women in Afghanistan. The men oppress the women. And we have to educate the men. Yeah. If we really want to build a better future for women in Afghanistan, we have to educate the men. And this, this, is, a global, uh, this is a global issue. This isn't just Afghanistan. No, I mean, good God, look at, America, look at America today. It's like the men with bad haircuts are out there oppressing women like crazy in, in, the, in the legislatures across this country. Totally. Um, it, it's like... We can't, it's like we, we're having trouble educating the men in America, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so they, they she, she suggested we go to one of their programs. Yeah. So they go out into these small towns all around Afghanistan, yeah. very rural areas, uh, gather up young men and do these training courses 
on uh, the civic duties and rights of women young in society. Afghani, young Afghani men? Yes. And, and uh, they told us to go witness one of these. So we went, we watched, participated in the graduation. And these men were very happy and excited to get really? this training. They loved it. That's not what we see on the news. All we see on the news is, 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 is our men, or the violence towards women in Afghanistan. That's what we see on the news. We don't see the men who really are grateful or, ha or want to work with women. And it, that's the majority of them. Uh, the problem is this outreach, uh, they have to have the space to do this outreach. Yeah. Uh, for example, the building where these men were doing this was bombed by uh, not local Taliban, but just local people who didn't agree with what was going on. Yeah. Uh, and I asked one of the men, and he pointed up and down the street, and he says, there's, a, there's a, a Kalashnikov in every direction that you look in this country. It would be very easy for all of us to pick up weapons and seek revenge, yeah. but we're not going to. Yeah. We're going to keep using this building, and we're yeah. going to show them what peace and nonviolence really is by continuing to educate each other uh, and not using violence to fight back. Yeah. So, you know, by the women stepping up and saying, we're going to educate you, they really stimulated nonviolence in that community, and then the men followed. So uh, the women there are doing very powerful work. Uh, they just need more space so they can continue yeah. to grow. Yeah. I just, I just wish, I just, it just strikes me as, as, as being monstrously hypocritical. I never really believed that we were there to help the women in Afghanistan <laughs> in the first place. And uh, it's, just, it's just funny how we just dropped that narrative altogether. Um, you do a lot of traveling across the country. That's correct. And your, with your group? The group is uh, a ride till the end. Or yeah. Art, A R T T E. We yeah. started out of uh, Fayetteville, Arkansas, on May first, two thousand and ten. Uh, we've covered over seven thousand miles now. A large chunk of that is in the American South. So uh, we've covered quite a bit of ground. Gone so through a lot what, do you, of what do you do? What do you? I mean, you ride, you ride from town to town, but what do you do? Well, we're a performance arts collective, Yeah. Uh, first and foremost. So we use our music, our poetry, uh, street theater, uh, whatever we can to challenge the narrative of war. And this is a two-sided coin yeah. because on the other side uh, is healing. Right. When we go through this catharsis, tell our story, and people listen, uh, then it, it helps us heal ourselves. Yeah. Uh, and it helps heal the perception of war. So the people who are listening have a new perspective. Yeah. And we have been able to take one more thing out of our pack, so to speak, and, and it gets a little lighter. Yeah. I, I guess it is um, because I, I, I can't imagine. Uh, because everyone, everyone has so much emotional baggage. Mm. I mean, when you, when you reach certain stages in your life, everyone has so much emotional baggage. Mm. But I, I can't imagine what it must be like um, just... Uh, for you veterans, just to, with this baggage that you're having to, to travel around the country with and to try to educate people. It is. It's tremendously heavy uh, and daunting. Um, and uh, a lot of vets that I work with, and myself included, uh, see a lot of our psychological damage uh, as from carrying around the knowledge and experience that this is an unjust war. Yeah. But how do we talk about it? Yeah. And who do we talk to? Right. And how do, how do we reconcile our own spiritual uh, uh, wounds? And how do we heal those wounds? Right. So, you know, a, a lot of the frustration and hatred I see, especially working with veterans, is that they know they did something wrong. Yeah. They just don't know what to do about it. Right. Is that wrong? Uh, yesterday was Memorial Day. Mm hmm And uh, do, you have any, do you have any particular thoughts about yesterday being Memorial Day, even though this will play several weeks after Memorial Day. Uh, do you have any particular thoughts about yesterday being Memorial Day in, in terms of what you do? Well, there, there was a mother uh, that stood on stage with us, Mary Kirkland, yeah, uh, who said a very moving piece. She held a picture of her son who had committed suicide. Uh, he's a veteran. He attempted multiple times to do this, sought mental health, uh, was denied, wasn't taken seriously, and finally he uh, took his life and she stood on the stage and said, uh, the Department of Defense killed my son, not an enemy uh, overseas. And uh, it was very moving and she went on to say, uh, we need to heal the wounded, honor the dead, stop the wars. Yes. And that was a very powerful statement coming from her. And if, if, 
If there's one thing I would like to see us do on Memorial Day, it is reflect on the true cost of what has happened, yes. on what's been gained, and on what's been lost. Um, it's heartbreaking for me to see uh, the country not taking Memorial Day seriously or, or thinking we can honor the fallen uh, by putting a, a flower on a grave. And that is important, but it's also important to be critical about what we're doing so there isn't more fallen next year. It's like we go through the motions. Mm -hmm. um, it's like we go through the motions, you get the flag ceremonies, and you get the uh, car sales. And that's what you get, you know? Totally. Totally, and, and you know, this was mentioned earlier, uh, uh, what patriotism is and, and uh, about being a patriot. You know, being a patriot isn't blindly towing the line of the government or the narrative that you're given. Being a patriot to the core of what patriotism is in this country is challenging the narrative right. of the government and standing up to the government. Uh, so, you know, and I hate to throw that around like that because we are the government, we are the people. Uh, but at some point we do have to question what we're being told in order to be patriot. Oh, why not throw it around? I mean, a lot of people just, a lot of people just thinking about the next price of the next iPod. Why not, <laughs> why not throw it around? Um, there's, um, you're talking about the woman who talked about uh, the Department of Defense killed her son. We are talking earlier before the show, and we are talking about Chicago, mm -hmm. and uh, the VA system in Chicago. And you were telling me, like, in Chicago, it could take up to, what, 500 days to get a claim? Over uh, 500 yeah. days on average uh, to get a claim. Some, uh, some of the vets I was talking to up there said they knew people who have been waiting over eight years. Uh, and these are people who have serious needs, uh, mental health needs, and physical needs. Um, and uh, I was speaking with one vet up there. Uh, who had told me that, you know, there are many vets who have died waiting for their claim to process, um, which is completely outrageous. That's morally obscene. I mean, that's, I mean, we, I mean and so we go, I mean, we, we do this crap. We go through the, 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 the crap of, of honoring our soldiers with, the, with the, 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 the stuff on Facebook and the, and the, um, and, and the big newspaper stuff, you know, we, with the big parades. And, but, but we don't really honor them because if we honor them. We'd really take care of the VA. We'd really take care of the soldiers. Totally. You know, that's what Memorial Day should be about, you know, uh, helping veterans get their benefits, uh, helping them put their life back together. Um, you know, we have uh, over 18 veterans commit suicide a day right now in this country, and that rate is climbing. Uh, and it's going to get even higher as, as more and more and more uh, soldiers and service members all together get out of the military. Uh, and until we start taking this seriously as a nation, if we truly want to honor our heroes, um, it's, it's going to go downhill. And that's not even addressing uh, how many homeless vets there are. No, the homeless population is astronomical. Uh, I technically am a homeless veteran given the lifestyle that I live, yeah. and, and I interact with a lot of homeless veterans. Um, and it's just really hard because it, once, once a vet gets to that point, um, the mental health that is needed yeah. is usually not there. It's hard to reach out for it and ask for it. Uh, social skills start to deteriorate very right. quickly. Um, so the odds of recovery get lower and lower. I hate to, to make this sound very grim because there are many, many programs that I've come across yeah. in this country that operate outside of the VA right. that help veterans get on their feet and put their right. life back together. So there is good stuff out there. Right, there's there's great good resources. stuff out there, but I mean, and, and obviously there are some just spectacular failures too. Yeah, there is. And, you know, I, I would say that even the VA, some uh, VAs around the country are awesome. Like the VA system in the Ozarks here yeah. is really good. Really, really good. They processed my claim in yeah. under 60 days. That's pretty good. That's compared to 500 days. That's great. Yeah. When I told yeah. when I told some of my friends uh, uh, how quickly it processed down here, then they told me how long it takes to process up there, and I, I felt pretty. I felt kind of bad. Uh, so it's you know I shouldn't have to feel like I need to keep that to myself, but I no, do you shouldn't have it, to keep it to yourself. I mean that's just that's a shame, and it's a shame on the system up there. And it's a shame on their 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 legislators for not um, pushing putting pressure on the VA system. Mm -hmm. I mean it's 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 no it's no shame on you. Um, what have the reactions been? Um, not only to to your uh, throwing the medals, but all the, also the reactions to what you do. Uh, for the most part, it's been overwhelmingly positive. 
uh, the medal ceremony was unanimously positive for the people who attended. Yeah. Uh, actually, the only person that screamed something obscene at me all day was a police officer. Uh, everyone else uh, stood uh, hand in hand with us. Um, and I'm sorry that police officer felt that way. And uh, there was a lot of police officers that had tears in their eyes yeah. while we were doing this. Or, or they would give us a little thumbs up when we were marching by. So yeah. that in no way represented all police officers. Right. It was just kind of ironic. Uh, because we had this group of protesters to our right. They were like, hey, we love you guys. And then on yeah. our left side, there was an officer screaming at us. Yeah. Now, one, one of the questions, one of the things you do is, is educate people. Mm -hmm. And um, I, guess, I guess almost every day is spent educating people, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And, and it's educating myself as well. Uh, the more I learn about this war and the more stories and experiences I hear, yeah. uh, the more sense that it makes. This is one of the most complicated things I've ever tried to understand in my life. It may be the most complicated thing this generation faces in terms of what it's done to our country, our infrastructure, our financial system, our national treasure, our security infrastructure. All these things have been dramatically shifted because of what's happened over the past 10 years. Do you think, do you think part of it, um, because we don't have a national draft anymore, and, and, and I don't want to return to the draft. But do you think part of it is because we don't have a national draft um, that a lot of people just really are not touched by the war? Yeah, I think that's very, uh, that is very obvious. It's something people don't want to talk about. But, uh, you know, during the Vietnam era, there were people defecting and joining the Viet Cong. There were, there were U.S. soldiers yeah. who were killing their, their commanding officers, fragging their officers, you know. There was a huge amount of resistance within the ranks, people producing their own media and publications, uh, anti-war literature, uh, you know, mass sit-ins on bases. Right. Uh, so a And large... stuff that has been lost in the popular culture now. Oh, totally. And, and you know, a lot of speculation for why that happened in Vietnam was the draft. Right. Because the war was everyone's problem and people were forced to do it against their will. Uh, nowadays, it doesn't touch people like that. So. Uh, you don't hear about people defecting from the U.S. military and joining the Taliban. No, this is what you, this is, if you talk about Vietnam now, this is what you hear, that hundreds of people were lined up at airports spitting on returning soldiers. Right. This is what you hear about. And that's all you hear about Vietnam. And, and it's interesting, you know, there's a documentary uh, called Sir No Sir yeah. uh, about GI resistance during the Vietnam era. And one of the people in that documentary had done some serious investigation into that incident and what he ultimately discovered that it was uh, a rumor yeah. that, that 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 incident uh, more than likely didn't even happen. Uh, but it was just something that's tossed around and, and said commonly when people reference that war. I uh, know, and you can't, you can't get people to, and people swear up and down it happened to their father or it happened to their father's best friend. And, you know, I mean, it just, you can't get them, you know. Bigfoot, you know. So, uh, <laughs> but um, so, what are your plans for the immediate future? What, I mean, what are your what are your plans? What's what's happening in your immediate future? Well, I came home to Arkansas for a little bit, see some family, to rest and relax. This was a very uh, intense experience, uh, and it requires some reflecting and resting. Uh, and then in June, I'll be going to Philadelphia to tra to train with a group called Training for Change. Yeah. Uh, which does uh, social justice and nonviolent training uh, for people like myself, mostly low-income people. Uh, it's a month long, and it's train-to-trainer -train training. So basically, they're training us to train other people to be trainers. Uh, so I'll go do that and then spend most of the rest of the year uh, training people for uh, social justice and nonviolence. Do you... You we remember talking about low income. You just brought this up, low income. Do you almost see this as a working class issue? Uh, I see uh, the military, you mean, in this war. Yeah. I see it 100% as a labor issue. Uh, and, you know, one of the things that really gave the anti-war movement steam in the Vietnam era was the civil rights movement. Right. Uh, without the steam from the civil rights movement, the anti-war movement would not have been able to do what it did. Yeah. Uh, so, and, and nowadays, I think the labor movement holds that steam for the anti-war movement because it is, large, it is largely uh, the working class that is targeted to serve yeah. in these wars. Yeah. Uh, and again, 
it's the working class who shoulders the, the barren attacks that Absolutely. pays for the war. So, Absolutely. you know, the working class, the labor movement is really taking the blunt of this. Uh, and whenever these two can come together um, and form a union, we might see something similar to what and we yet saw the back working then. class, the, the working class in this country is the one who is least informed about the war. Oh, of course. Because the media in this country um, is doing such a piss poor job of informing them. And so many people don't know where to go mm. for information. So the working class is ill-served by um, the media and by the government. So um, they're sort of like trapped in the middle. And so uh, you got it, well, that's the economic draft because they're joining the military because there's nowhere else to go. Mm -hmm. And uh, they can't even talk about it really no. because they don't know how to talk about it. So um, a lot of them are just, um, it's a stark patriotism and they, they can't, uh, I, a lot of my friends who are who are working class cannot talk about this issue without just bowing up and and just talking about how great America is because they don't they don't know very much about the war and they don't want to know specifics. Mm -hmm. And I think that is uh, an overall uh, symptom of what's what this nation is suffering from. We're very juvenile yeah. in our policies and uh, how we deal with conflict. Right. Uh, very reactionary yes. and violent, and that's juvenile behavior. Right. Uh, a mature person opens dialogue, a mature person will sit down to the table and talk about something and try to resolve conflict instead of instigating it. Uh, and this uh, projectionist attitude of, of America, this great beautiful thing without accountability for what it's really doing, right. uh, you know, is another symptom of this juvenile consciousness yes. that we have. And uh, I think one of the greatest things we could do as a nation in changing the world is, is to mature. Right. And who benefits from an attitude like that? It's not, it's not the people who, uh, who say we're the greatest country in the world. It's, it's people above them who are profiting from it. Totally. They're the ones totally. profiting from it. And, and, and in the end, those people don't even benefit from it. Yeah. You know, they're not growing from this. No. Uh, and ultimately, their soul's going to suffer for those decisions as yes. well. So no one really benefits from what we're doing right now. No. You know, I found an interesting quote from you online because I, I, I Google, which, as I've said before, Googling is, the, is our new form of stalking. Uh, you found uh, you had another word to describe the war on terrorism, and you said that word is shame. Mm. Yeah, that's right. When uh, when I stood up to return my medals, I said I have one war or one word to describe this global war on terrorism decoration, and that word is shame. And I feel a great deal of shame uh, in the aftermath of of war uh, about what I did and not knowing any better. Uh, and I, you know, I've forgiven myself for that. Uh, but again, that doesn't mean I don't feel that shame. Because I, I, I consider myself a warrior. Yeah. And I have a, a warrior's heart, you know. And, and what I've learned, to the, a warrior has empathic understanding with the enemy. A warrior doesn't hate the enemy. Right. A warrior feels grief at the very thought of harming the enemy. Uh, and uh, ultimately, my warrior heart was taken advantage of. Uh, and my brothers and sisters were taken advantage of as well. Um, and that's terrible. Yeah. There's no more sacred contract than the contract to protect and serve. Yeah. Uh, and for that to be taken advantage of is shameful and heartbreaking. Um, a lot of people find it hard to believe that soldiers feel this way. That soldiers have this sort of sort of emotional upheaval in their lives because they just want to see, see everybody sort of like Charlie Sheen or Chuck Norris, right? You know, tour of duty type. Uh, but you deal with a lot of, of, of former soldiers too. Who go, go through this sort of emotional catharsis, don't you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's it's shattering. You know, uh, one of the uh, there, this is a crucial step that I see a lot of very brave veterans take in the uh, peace and anti-war movement, and that is um, being able to say this isn't just something that the government did and I yeah. participated in this is okay, but being able to say, I take full responsibility for my actions, right. I'm accountable for what happened, and I'm ready to do something about it. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, crossing that line is uh, very healing, but it's also very, very painful. Yeah. Uh, and it can cause, as you say, some emotional upheaval 
to suddenly take full responsibility for war. I guess it's kind of scary too, isn't it, inside? It is. Yeah, it, yeah it, it shatters it shatters your own self-image, yeah. your worldview. You know, right. a lot of things uh, will fall apart if you take that right. responsibility, but it provides the fertile ground for rebirth. So. Right. So uh, I want to talk about uh, something else before we go. Um, you're a singer and songwriter as well. Mm-hmm. And uh, you have some stuff on YouTube. What are your songs about? What are your well, kind of the core of the music that we do on A Ride Till the End uh, are military cadences, yeah. which are things that we sing as we march or run in formation. Yeah. Uh, and we church those up a little bit, uh, turn them into bluegrass songs, uh, so that we can go into all kinds of different venues and play them, give people uh, a little insight into kind of the, the psychology in the military uh, and what we scream out loud as we march around together. Yeah. Uh, and some of them are stark, some of them are funny. Uh, but it's, it's nice to show people, you know, some of the chanting that yeah. is involved. And uh, also, you know, when we do this publicly, often there's vets and they know those songs. Yeah. And they are more than happy to sing them with us uh, because it's a, it takes us back to a very special place. Yeah. Do you, is there a part of you that misses being in the military? Oh, totally, uh, totally. I was paid to uh, to jump out of airplanes, uh, which is something I would have done. Cool. I would have done cool. that for free. Yeah, you know, uh, and uh, I loved it. I loved the yeah. camaraderie. I loved everyone working for a common goal. Yeah. Uh, I loved being paid to go camp and train and run around in the woods. Yeah. Uh, but at the end of the day, I had to look at well, what all this is for right. and what we're being used for, and and I had to back away from it, but. I very much love it. I loved it. Okay. And now I'm, I feel like I'm living the life again on my bicycle doing this work. Okay. Well, Jacob, um, after the credits run, we're going to hear some of your music. So I want to thank you very much for being on the show today. Well, thank you, Richard. All right. I want to thank you all for watching, and uh, we'll see you next week.
spun me around, I had no hair. And it won't be long till I get on back I used to be a high school stud Now I'm marching in the mud and It won't be long till I get on back home Well I used to date a beauty queen And now I love my M16 It won't be long till I get on back home Well, mama, mama, don't you cry Your little boy ain't gonna die It won't be long till I get on back home Hip I'm Adela Gray, and you are watching Fayetteville Public Access TV. Members of the American Postal Workers Union handle more than 165 billion letters and packages a year. That's about 34 million pounds of mail every day. Ever wonder what this costs you as a taxpayer? Millions? Tens of millions? Hundreds of millions? Not a single cent. The United States Postal Service doesn't run on your tax dollars. It's funded solely by stamps and postage. Brought to you by the men and women of the American Postal Workers Union. <laughs> this last song we're going to do, um, I think you will all be able to relate to. We try to do some music that um, can kind of bring anybody into it. Um, some of the stuff we do, some people are kind of like, oh, no, I don't care about that. <laughs> I don't care about that topic. Um, but this song, really, I don't know how anybody could not care about it. Um, and it is in a foreign language, so I will be interpreting. We back up here now. On a bit of a leash here. Joan's not used to it. <laughs>
song is called A Back Porch Boogie. Well, I was sitting out on the back porch, picking with my brother Bill. I said, you know, I love the boogie boogie, and I probably always did. Sometimes we played on the front porch for the whole wide world to see. But when we come round back, it's a natural back, it's a back porch boogie for me. Back porch boogie. Back porch boogie. Back porch boogie, you can boogie boogie all my life. Got Brother Bill's bass on the back beat, clamp on playing on the drums. You know that feel when we all get together. It's a boogie woogie son of a gun. Back porch boogie, back porch boogie, back porch boogie. You can boogie woogie all night long. Back porch boogie, back porch boogie, back porch boogie. You can boogie woogie all. Dancing in the yard, Ken and Nandy playing their guitar. Doctor Blues blowing on the horn. All our friends and neighbors start to gather round. Seems everybody wants to get a little closer to the back porch boogie boogie sound. Back porch boogie, back porch boogie, back porch boogie. You can boogie boogie all night long. Back porch boogie, you can boogie boogie all night long. Back porch boogie, you can boogie boogie all night long. Oh, the back porch boogie, you can boogie boogie all night long. 